So, now uh, in uh, the last module we have started talking about uh, semiconductor nanocrystals. We have uh, discussed uh, Rosenthal's work where they had obtained a bi exponential decay for cadmium selenide nanoparticles and the important thing that we learned from that study was that uh, the uh, every time constant has a contribution from a radiative part and a non radiative part. Of course, there can be special cases when one of the amplitudes can be 0. I mean one of the rate constants may not contribute that is a different issue, but the general scenario we should not forget is that every time constant is associated not only just one radiative or non one non radiative process. And we had also said that very often you have ultra long lived trap states not always you can try and make nanoparticles where these trap states are almost not there, but uh, in most of the cases you have long lived trap states which is usually a hindrance because uh, that would steal uh, from the bandage emission intensity, but in some cases trap state emission has been used effectively to make things like white light emitting nanoparticles or uh, red emitting nanoparticles which have different kinds of use. So, what is established in this work of Karki and Pulleritz and others is that for cadmium selenide there are two types of radiative traps. So, it is not a single exponential decay and secondly uh, if you pump with higher energies there is more efficient trapping. We will not go very deep into this uh, right now, but when we talk about multi excitons and all we will talk about the effect of uh, pump energy as well. Now, uh, let us move on to another piece of work by Wies and co workers and here we will not complete the discussion in uh, this module. What we will do is we will discuss the philosophy of what they have done and then we will come back in the next module and then discuss uh, the uh, uh, mathematical detail that they have used in their data analysis. So, this is uh, the system that they worked with cadmium selenide uh, nanocrystals once again uh, rather small and now we are familiar with this absorption spectrum. You can see the bandage absorption you know uh, what it is uh, which electron uh, level which hole level is involved and you can see the other structure very nicely that uh, we had shown earlier in the previous module and this is the emission spectrum. The point to note is that these are nanoparticles where not much of trap emission is there, but the emission quantum yield is as low as 5 percent not great as low as 5 percent because if you look at the uh, decays of photoluminescence here you, you might notice that we and co-workers do not use the term fluorescence and phosphorescence. So, they are in deviation with uh, Rosenthal's uh, assignment. So, you see almost all the PL has decayed within uh, the first nanosecond. However, if you look more carefully, so this is the decay that you get using a femtosecond optical gating of conversion and this inset shows the decay of PL using TCSPC and that goes on for hundreds of nanosecond. So, this is the interesting as well as problematic aspect of working with this kind of nanoparticles. You have ultra fast decays, you have ultra slow decays and everything means something it is not easy to uh, separate the components and say which one means what. And that is why uh, this paper in ACS Nano 2011 is very useful because it uh, gives you a good idea about what to do with this uh, many time constants that you get. In most of the papers they are dealt with rather sloppily, but this is one paper where they had done a thorough analysis. Of course, uh, whenever you do something like this many of the models are phenomenological, many of the models are just empirical uh, and can be debated and that is why so much of work is going on even now because the last word is not really out all right. So, let us show you some of the uh, time constants that they got. So, when they looked at the uh, time resolved PL peak at 580 nanometer they got uh, 6 exponentials. 
3 from up conversion, 3 from TCSPC. So, you see 4.5 picosecond and 48 picosecond, these are in agreement with Rosenthal's work. Remember, Rosenthal had got uh, by exponential decays for her PLD case, femtosecond time regime, picosecond time regime, they get that. What they get in addition is this 730 femtosecond time scale. So, this is something that one can miss very easily if the resolution of the instrument is not good enough. And the other thing that they have got and Rosenthal did not most likely because Rosenthal did not try to do a TCSPC experiment and they did is that they got these three time constants 1.4 nanosecond, 13 nanosecond, 45 nanosecond. Now, there are papers where the, the uh, ultra fast component is not even considered and these three lifetimes uh, obtaining uh, being obtained in TCSPC is quite common and uh, remember this is not trap emission here, this, we are not talking about uh, a very red shifted emission. If trap emission component is there, then the trap emission is uh, hidden within the bandage emission itself. So, the energy of the trap is very close to the bandage. So, this is an experiment which is more carefully done and more thorough in which the ultra fast as well as the slow components everything have been uh, considered. But now the question is what will we do with so many components? How does one make sense of this? One way of making sense of uh, complicated systems is to do more than one kind of experiment and they did. They did tra transient absorption experiments and compared the results with the time resolved uh, photoluminescence experiments. So, this is the transient absorption that you can see again the, what is this feature this strong uh, negative feature naturally ground state breach here you would see some kind of a uh, transient absorption and here again ground state bleach and of course, this signal in this entire range is a complete mix because do not forget the absorption is not just here, it keeps on going up. So, whatever plus signal that you see is really a net signal, there is a minus component as well. Okay. What is the most notable thing in this uh, uh, spectrum? I would say the quality it looks like a steady state spectrum, it is absolutely smooth, right. So, it is beautiful. Now, so then they looked at the ground state breach recovery, not only in picosecond, but also in nanosecond. So, uh, they did flash photolysis as well. So, as you can see, the ground state bleach is not recovered completely within uh, even after 1 nanosecond and this is a major difference between the uh, transient absorption data and time resolved PL data. Time resolved PL remember was gone in uh, so hundreds of nanosecond, hundreds of picosecond. Well, not hundreds of picosecond, if you go beyond 1 nanosecond, you can see that uh, time resolved PL is almost gone, okay. but here you can actually see that the ground state breach recovery is not complete. That means that uh, you do have states that are that do not radiate which are holding either the electron or the hole keeping them separated and not allowing complete recombination and regeneration of the ground state within 1 nanosecond and you get this long component in ground state breach recovery. So, first of all what is vindicated here is that the nanosecond signal that you get in time resolved PL is not rubbish. Okay. As we know whenever we talk about fluorescence or photoluminescence we are very picky, we always think that there may be some impurity and whatever long lifetime is there is perhaps because of a small amount of impurity that can happen here also. But what transient absorption looks at is the bulk, it is looking at absorption right. So, uh, if there is very small quantity of some impurity it will not show up in transient absorption. So, from here first thing we learned is that that long component that was seen in transient in time resolved PL was genuine. 
Now, if you compare the uh, time constants, something interesting happens. First of all, that 0 0.73 picosecond component does not show up. So, where is it gone? Secondly, you see 4.5 picosecond in TRPL, 4.5 picosecond in uh, transient absorption, 48, 13 and 12, 45 and 46. Amazing, beautiful match. The only thing that is not matching is instead of 1.4 nanosecond, you are getting 0.7 nanosecond, which may be okay. When you do a 6 exponential fit in all and when you stitch together two kinds of experiments, one out of six components going awry is fine. Right. So, this is uh, what they have got. Now, the problem is where is that 730 picosecond component? Why is it that you do not see it in transient absorption? Actually, it is seen in transient absorption, but not in the visible range of probe. So, the other experiment that was done is transient absorption, but using NIR probe. And already there was literature which said that this transient absorption in NIR is due to uh, bandage to higher energy states. In fact, one can even guess that you are getting a positive signal. So, from bandage it must you must be probing uh, transition from bandage to higher. It is just that those energy levels are much closer than the band gap that is inherently there. That is why it is NIR and not uh, visible. Now, the literature that existed had established and again for the paucity of time we will not go into how they established is actually an interesting uh, thing to know, but it was established that of this transient absorption spectrum the higher energy part is dominated by electrons, the lower energy part is dominated by holes. Very interesting papers one should read them okay. and then when you look at transients across the transient absorption band, when you plot delta O d versus time, this is what you get. At 900 nanometer, you get this kind of a uh, decay. At 1400 nanometer, once again remember uh, this Tahara's work that we had shown, tails were matched and at the blue edge of the emission spectrum, we could see the ultra fast component nicely. Uh, this plot is uh, similar. These long components are there everywhere, but the short components gradually emerges as you go from higher energy side to lower energy side. What does that mean? Short component is not there in the higher energy side that is dominated by electron relaxation, but it is there in the lower energy side which is dominated by hole relaxation. What does it mean? It means that the ultra fast component that is there is associated with hole relaxation. It is as simple as that. The problem is when they just fit the data simply they did not see that 730 picosecond component, 730 femtosecond component. They got something like this. First two if you remember were very nice 4.5, 4.5, 48, 48. What they see is when you go into NIR 4.5 becomes 4.7 to start with which is we can say okay, within uh, acceptable limits and then it becomes 2.5. I have not shown the data in between. If you read the paper, all the data is given and you can see the gradual the, this decay become faster and faster and faster as you go from 900 to 1400 nanometer. Here we show you only the 1400 nanometer data. Here this component is 2.5. And then even tau 3 instead of 43, 48, 43 they are similar, it has become 26. Tau 4 is actually uh, uh, something like 0 0.39 nanosecond and tau 5 could not be determined very nicely because in the NIR experiment they did not have flash photolysis. So, this is uh, not a very good fit. So, what appears from this is that this analysis is not quite right. The NIR UV pump visible pump NIR probe uh, experiment analysis is not quite right because uh, we expect to see that 730 femtosecond component because it has to be somewhere in some range it has to be there because it is there in time resolved PL it, that is not showing up. And this 4 picosecond component that is sort of sacrosanct in our minds 
that is becoming 2.5 when does that happen you know very well that uh, there are two components you miss the faster one but the component that you see which should not have become faster appears to become fast when that does that happen when you actually have the slow component but you are not looking for it you understand what i'm saying you have it's a multi exponential decay right you are fitting to four exponential functions so it is not very difficult to lose one of the components but then it is there so what it will do is it will show up in some other component remember average lifetime sum over i ai tau i so suppose i fit instead of a bi exponential decay i fit to a single exponential decay what will happen i have a bi exponential decay of course it will not even fit but let us say just to understand the situation that uh, i have a 4 nanosecond decay and i have a 2 nanosecond decay or uh, let us make it more realistic 2 nanosecond 4 nanosecond 8 nanosecond three components are there i fit it to a bi exponential function and usually it will fit maybe chi square will be a little bad i fit it to a bi exponential function what will happen i will not get 2 4 6 i'll not even get 4 and 6 perhaps i'll get like 3 and 5 or something like that so because i am not accounting for the genuine short component that is there the other components will also appear to be shorter than they are same is true for longer component okay so here is the issue uh, uh, here the important thing that uh, comes is what we had discussed while talking about data analysis data analysis cannot be done blindly you cannot just take whatever comes out of the program you have to think that what should be the situation in your system and you have to use an appropriate model okay so the appropriate model they used was first of all they did what we have discussed uh, towards the beginning of this uh, course they did global analysis global analysis across this transient absorption nir band so they took 21 decays so here the good thing is that uh, you are recording the spectrum right so in principle you can take very large number uh, it, it's uh, because you have many pixels there so they took 21 decays and they fit to actually six components five components i think is wrong six components why six components because you expect that there are five components that you see from transient absorption and a sixth one from your uh, fluorescence uh, well photoluminescence so fit to six components is a mistake six components and also what they did is they fix the lifetimes and this is where this can be contested one can say why are you fixing the lifetime you vary it globally but they did not do that instead of so they call it global analysis but what they have really done is that they have fixed the lifetimes perhaps because transient absorption data as we know is not as nice as tcspc data it may not be so easy to do proper global analysis using it especially in nir but this is what they did they fixed the lifetimes six lifetimes and they did uh, an analysis so what would change what are the uh, variables here the amplitudes yeah the amplitudes are the variables so they got the amplitudes for different wavelengths and they plotted this is the plot of amplitudes versus wavelength we will focus only on the on c1 and c5 this is c1 right what is c1 associated with 0.73 picosecond 730 femtosecond so as you see in the higher energy side from 900 to 1100 nanometer that amplitude is actually zero then it rises to some value in the lower energy side remember lower energy side is dominated by holes okay we don't even have to go into the rest lower energy side dominated by holes so from there what they did is they assigned this 0.73 picosecond component 730 femtosecond component to ultra fast hole relaxation okay and that's only the beginning of the story so what we have learned in this module is that handling data in this kind of uh, situations is 
the most difficult part of the game. Recording itself is a challenge because you need good data. Without good data, it's useless. And uh, that's why it helped that they had such a smooth absorption spectrum. But what you do with the data, that is actually what takes maybe 75 percent of time when you do experiments like this, not recording data, not preparing the sample. So, what they have done so far, what we have discussed is that they have fitted their NIR data to six components coming from uh, the uh, visible uh, probe transient absorption and PL. And from here, they have been able to get that el earlier elusive uh, 730 frame to second component is assigned to ultra fast hole relaxation. The next step is a closer look at the components themselves. And that is what we are going to take up in the next module.